Hi guys, uh, this is the fourth session for the winter seminar. Today we will talk about common practice and tools that you might use in your C++ project. So as I said before, uh, I'm graduating pretty soon in one month. So I'm not an expert in computer science. I just have some idea. I didn't work in the industry. So the things I said, uh, I said as an user. So you might find it useful, but I don't have much authority, I must say. So what's the motivation for this seminar? So, so far we have talked about tools that you might use outside of your project to help you how to code. But in this session, I will talk about tools that you use within your project as a part of your project. And it will help you a lot. And as for the assignments, they're not gonna help you that much, but if you want to publish something, you need to follow certain standards. And in the second part, we will talk about techniques, which uh, if you are building a big project, you need to use some of those techniques. So let's get started. Uh, let me lower the volumes to high. <laughs> okay, so this is the scope of uh, this presentation. So on the first part, we will talk about auto tools. Uh, second part, design patterns. as an overview of what is it. And the third part, we want to talk about one pattern. In my case, maybe the easiest to understand and to implement somehow. So why auto tools? So many of you have used make, a make file, when you want to build some source code which has several files. And at the time that you start adding more files, you might find that it's really hard to write the right make file. And it gets pretty hard when you have dependencies among the files. And well, in the make file, you can set up how to compile, but there is nothing about how to install or uninstall. So that's kind of hard. And that's a very big disadvantage of make. And one more thing is that in the make file, it's really hard to pass, let's say, variables, uh, preprocessor variables to the source code. And well, the other thing is that because you made the make file the way that you somehow like it or you got to do it, there is no standard. For a third person who is going to use your source code, he might find that he used a different standard. So he might struggle to actually make your make file to work. And lastly, uh, you build your make file for your platform. But what if the other user or developer is using a different Linux distribution or maybe Mac? So there is nothing that Mac will give it to you to help you solve the situation. And then, but on the other hand, Auto Tools gives you all the things that I said that Mac doesn't give it to you, but it has its own problems. So the very first one is that uh, AutoTools is very old software. It has been upgraded many times, but they really, the project tried to maintain compatibility with uh, previous hardware. So whenever you run, it will make many tests and checks for all software. 
a hardware, sorry. And that takes time and yeah, it's slow and there's not much sense about it. And at the same time, if you want to go through the code of AutoTools itself, if you want to extend it or learn how to you how it works, you might find all this the source code is very huge because it tried to check for this all hardware or platforms. So on the other hand, uh, when they made auto tools, they had in mind that the user might want to extend it quite a lot. And because it auto tools tries to uh, manage many different features, it happened to be very complex and kind of, ha yeah, really hard to master, I would say. And still at the moment, I use it daily, but for s some parts of auto tools, I have to refer to online documentation, which is not much out there. It's very ironic. Uh, auto tools is on a standard in Linux package and there is not much documentation. Uh, in this case, I encourage you to actually find a book about auto tools. That's how I learn it. Because if you rely on internet, you're gonna find very scattered information about each of the features. So yeah, auto tools, people always try to, to avoid it. So they try to use CMake, which it generates also the make files or others. I mean, like uh, I don't, I, I don't recall the names of other uh, building systems, but well, there is some others there. But still, we need auto tools, and that's why it's important, and that's why I'm mentioning in this presentation, and. The main reason is that it's very standard. If you have an auto tool project, you can actually create a Debian file or RPM file quite easily. There are many tools. Everyone understand about auto tools. Uh, auto tools is not doesn't only build the package. It also make tests to make sure that the platform where you are compiling and installing, it satisfy all the requirements. So at the moment, there is no such a competitor for C and C++ uh, projects. And because it's a standard, it's ubiquitous uh, in the whole Linux environment. So you will always find uh, uh, most of the open source projects that will release their own tarball and where which you can download and install by yourself. So one thing very important about auto tools is that uh, when you you need auto tools to develop, right? But to release a source code so that the user can compile by himself, the user doesn't need the auto tools. That's a very important feature. And that's maybe one of the reasons because it was selected as a standard Linux building system. And in the user perspective, not the developer, <laughs> and that this very important part, auto tools really make their lives easier to the users because they only have have to use very few comments. And auto tools will make will make all the checks for them. And if they're missing a library, they will get a message. You, you're missing the library version, blah, blah, blah. And it will install, I, I mean, it's a standard. So the user always run the same command, easy to, to learn. And yeah, it's overall, it's good thing to learn. And even though it looks weird and hard to use it, the time you get used to, you, you're gonna like it. So, uh, in this slide. So the first time, well, not the first time, but when I I got assigned to use auto tools in my projects, 
my image of auto tools was something like this. So this is an alchemist and he's making these very old tricks and strange and that's only he and few other weird dudes knew knows how to do it. So he make it work and it's amazing what he does, but it's very hard and it seems that this guy has been studying for his all life and experimenting. So that's what I thought about Autotools. It's like kind of like a tool that you have to be really, really nerd to actually know how to use it. And at the end, it was kind of useless. It's like an alchemist. It's going to nowhere. But ah, I was totally wrong. So let's start with the mini tutorial. So for the user, all that he has to do is to run these few comments. So, well, uh, this command, it's, it's good to run to know if there is any important option, but normally he doesn't need to, I mean, if he knows, he doesn't need to run, it just a help. And then, so well, essential ones. This one is not really part of auto tools, but it's a convention. And then he runs configure, which is gonna generate a make file. And in the prefix, it indicates in which path it will install the binaries, libraries, or other files. So, if you are using Ubuntu, OpenSUSE, Fedora, normally you will install a uh, out source code software in this path, which is designated for that kind of software that you install manually. Uh, in contrast to installing with a package manage manager. So, if after you run this command, everything goes fine. There is no error. You're not missing any dependency. You basically have a make file already, so you can just uh, type make install. One little detail that many people miss is that since a long time ago, make a uh, support parallel building, uh, which speed up quite a lot. So the parallel building, it's uh, specified with a J option and the number of processors you want to add. So obviously you want to add as much processor as your computer has. So that's it. And another note is that if you are missing a dependency from this command, uh, normally you can install it using your package manager which is can be sometimes hard because maybe you are missing a specific version which your distribution doesn't actually provide. So you might end up installing other source code library and it might be the case that the library also depends in another library or more than one. <laughs> So you might end up installing quite a lot of software by your hand. So that's the worst case scenario. It doesn't happen most of the time. As maybe with most of the famous lab, well, uh, most used libraries, if you're using small library, very specific with, they keep updating very, maybe, but well, it's not that normal to happen. So how it works for the developer? So we had this diagram, uh, it's cut here, but well, it's not very, well, so the file miss, so the rounded ones are commands that you're running. And then the squ square ones, rectangles actually, they are the, files which are created. This one is also a file, but you also run it. It's a script which is generated. So everything you provide 
to the auto tools is this make file that am uh, auto make stands for and the configure file which happened to be in here so after running these two commands you get this file and this file and then after editing this file by yourself and running this command you get this file and after <laughs> Uh, running this command, you get the configure script, and then after running the configure script, then and then you already have this make file that's uh, input. You get this configure status file, and then after you run it, you get your actually make file, and then after you run your make file, you get your code. So it's very <laughs> uh, well. They would try to make it very extendable, these projects, but it's a real mess and it's pretty hard. I, I, I forgot about the order. So normally what we do is to make a small file uh, called Autogen or Bootstrap, as I remember. And in here, it automatizes all this process uh, until here. So you only provide the configure.ac and the make file.am and then that file will do all this step. That script will make all those steps. So you can just ignore. It's it's not important. I mean it's good to know how it works, but I have never ever used auto header. So I uh, well, it's uh that's it. So yeah, that's uh, what I talked right before. Uh, this autogen file, it's an important thing because you're gonna find the in many s source code. And if you read a book about auto tools, they never mention about this and or in internet. So it's the kind of thing that you see there, but there is no information about it. So. So that's it. That's it's only a script that automatizes this process. It calls all this command in order, and that's it. So, well, another thing important here is that uh, normally we we run this sh autogen in the folder where this is the source code, and then when we want to build the actual source code we go to a different folder outside of the source code folder and then in there we actually call the make file and the reason is to uh, all these object file that might be a lot of them those ones are temporary you don't need them so after you install your software you can just remove them but if you keep it in your original source code folder, if you keep developing, it's gonna be very messy because then in Git, uh, you don't have to keep track of them, but they are there. So that's what uh, some sort of standard behavior that you might use and makes things easy. So let's go to an example. So, I created this. Uh, well, I created these four files. So the important one is a source code. It's a uh, main that cpp, and similarly to as the previous uh, seminars, we had this feature one source code, and we have our make file that am. So the make file that am it's the easiest part of auto tools it's really simple so this is how it looks the first line i commented we don't need it in this example so basically options that you want to pass to the compiler so normally if you're using c plus plus 11 you might use this option and then uh in this variable uh, you specify which uh, ex binaries you want to compile and you want to install. And then for this binary, you specify, you can see that it's the same name. 
So using the underscore sources, you can specify which files you need to compile. So that's it. If you give these two lines to auto make, it makes everything, uh, it creates a make file which compiles that source code and it install it and uninstall. And it can go, I mean, if you have many dependency, you just add the CPP files one after the other one. If you want to make a library, then you need like few more options. And then if you want to install a script instead of a binary, you will use the bin underscore script. That's it. So make file is easy. And then configure that AC. Okay, let's see with the BIM. It looks more pretty. So <clears throat> here are the options. So I should say, uh, as you can see here, Auto Tools, it's a set of commands or software. Uh, the main one is maybe AutoConf and AutoMake. And then you also have Leaf Tool, which is like an extension to create shared libraries. So you have to pass options to both of them. So the first one, AutoConf, you specify the name of the project, the version, your email, if there is any error, or I mean, if there is a bug and then they want to notify you, and then the website for your project, last one. Um, for AutoMake, AutoMake is the one which takes care of the make file. Uh, some options. Uh, this foreign, it means that it's some kind of flag option which specify that we don't want to follow any directory a structure or a standard like a GNU or any others. And subdirectory is objects. It's just to organize the object file in folders. It's not, imp well, it's important. Uh, I would recommend you to use it. It's easier. Uh, it's kind of removes some sort of errors. Uh, next, configuration header. So this one is mandatory and it's kind of hard to understand what it does. So sometimes in your C++ code, you might have some, <clears throat> sorry, you might have some variables that you specify in compilation time. And they usually call define, not variables, because it doesn't vary the value it holds. And so you might want to specify like the prefix or I don't know, like number of threads. So you specify in compilation time. So if you want to specify those variables, those defines constants, you define it in this file. And then that's the only thing. But you know how to create the file. If it doesn't exist, it just use a template. Just if you need a feature. But for some reason, it's mandatory. So you need to add this line. And then in here, you specify the location of your make file. Uh, here you're using a C++ project. So that's what you get. If you're using C, you will do simple as this one. And we are almost done. And then this one is mandatory. It indicates that uh, then generate this make file. So here's how it works. So this file is parsed by autoconf. So every macro, this one are macros, are actually substituted by a very big script. So that's why we need this one, because in this part of the script, it will actually make all the logic to generate the make files that you need. So, so yeah, that's it. You can extend it. That's only the very example version. So now we have three of them. Let me check the time. 
me four minutes. That's good. So first, first, uh, as I show you here, maybe, yeah, like this. SH auto gen. Uh, I forgot to show you about this auto. So yeah, uh, it run the commands in the graph I shown before. Uh, we don't need this one, but well, I have this template for lib tools and uh, lib tool projects. So we are not using lib tool here, so that that's why we don't need it. But anyways, it's and yeah that's all of them auto header auto com found to make easy local so i just run this auto gen and now i have all these files and the very important one it's this one so this one is a script that we're gonna use to generate our make file at this moment we have this make file that's uh inputs that oh sorry uh, it looks something like this and then all these variables between edge signs it will be uh substituted by an actual value that's uh, the configure script will substitute so they are quite a lot of that So, as I said, the uh, best thing that you can do is to make a folder called build. And then from the folder, uh, sorry, I, I shouldn't have done this one. Well, I call my configure script. And then it's good to first see the help. So there are many options. A uh, very important one, prefix. That's where, well, architecture independent files will be installed. Well, I think all the files. Uh, I, 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 don't, I didn't know about this one. <laughs> but yeah, normally they install everything after whatever you specify the prefix. And then if you want to go more fine grain, so maybe binaries you want to install somewhere and then HTML files in another directory. So yeah, you can do what you need. And important thing here is that you can also pass in this part C++, uh, I mean the, the compiler name or flags to the linker libraries so why it is important so if you are given a tarball you cannot generate the configure script as we just done running this autogen however you might want to change the compiler you're using or different libraries so in this with those options you can actually do it and the suffix it's good if you are using different version they're in the same path and and well that's it so we we're gonna run the configure with the prefix right here uh how it works so it runs on test. Uh, very few of them at this moment. And yeah, it generates a make file, this config.h. So as I said, let me show you this config. So in here you can specify. So this defines will be included in your C++ code. So that's why it's uh, it's an important thing. And you get your make file, final make file. So 
now <laughs> all these previous variable they are being substituted by their values and now you can call make and then makes run the command to compile and important part i like this one so you don't need to know about all of this right i mean it's useless especially if you have a lot of code uh so there is this option which silence the output so you just get this so if we remove our feature one and uh, main that all if we call it will recompile so yeah you get this nice thing that's like okay in this line we are compiling uh main that cpp and in this file we are linking so it's very it's a good way of visualizing and then make install so yeah it's installed in in this binary folder so it will just install uh this one it will just copy there so that that's it and then if we uninstall we don't have any more <laughs> so that's it in our in our example it's only one uh binary and one source code but if you scale to use a lot of source code files it comes pretty handy and that's it pretty much uh you can find more information out there about auto tools and i highly encourage you to get, get to know about this and use it more because uh, as i said it's an standard in linux and fortunately or unfortunately in unist you got to use a lot of linux and it's good for your life and as a developer as a coder so it's uh, important uh, knowledge so next parts <clears throat> let me drink my coffee so design patterns <laughs> so design patterns uh the concept the concept of design patterns uh is an interesting concept so if you think about architecture when he wants to build a bridge he doesn't come up with the whole I mean, he based his design in previous design and he used many techniques already done, which are standard. And maybe he actually have to use it in order to be approved his um, blueprints. So uh, same analogy you might use uh, for uh, design patterns in computer science. So when you're making a software, in the part where you are designing the software you can do by yourself you can kind of figure out a good diagram or well or maybe you can use some knowledge that's in the computer science community we already have that it helps you to build software to design software in a solid manner and those patterns uh, have been well studied and they know the benefits and the drawbacks for all of them and other guys they will know the names of the patterns so when you want to describe the structure of your code you can just use those patterns names and then the other guy will understand so mm, important to say uh, when you are coding a uh, software more or less important actually coding part is a small part of a very small big part is going back to the code and fixing some parts or going back to the code and trying to figure out why you did it in that way and so you got to spend way more time reading your code or other people call than actually coding. 
So if you have certain patterns in your in the structure of your code, it's simplified because it's easy. Uh, you know what I said, right? And other thing is that uh, as many people have used it, they are, it's already tested. Uh, so, well, you don't have to reinvent the wheel, right? So there is a little problem. Uh, I cannot cover all of the patterns here. Actually, not even a few of them. There are many of them. Okay, uh, like actually in Wikipedia, there is a good list. So <laughs> we had those ones, those ones, those ones. Yeah, quite a lot. This one is a different aspect, quite important nowadays. But I don't know that much. Maybe it's a few of them. Yeah, yeah three, three, four. Anyways, so uh, something I should say. There is the very famous book I have in my hand right now. It's uh, from Design Patterns. It's called uh, Elements of Reusable Object Oriented Software. I totally recommend it from the '94. Uh, author it was Gamma and Helm. Anyways. So I will focus on one pattern as an introduction. Uh, and this, that pattern is a strategy pattern. So imagine that you have, uh, well, you have a class, right? That depending of the situation, you want one function to have two different behaviors, two different algorithms. So you can use if else, you can make two different classes, you can do, there are many solutions, but many engineers and scientists came out that if you program a language support polymorphism, maybe using inheritance and polymorphism and abstract method, it might be better to encapsulate uh, the dependencies. And that's actually a very important concept. In your code, in each component, you want to reduce the amount of dependency at most. If you had eight classes, it's maybe not important, but if you happen to have 120 classes, then you want to do that. <laughs> so here's how it looks. So we had this class, which use a strategy class. So a strategy is just the name for the diagram, but it can be any anything. So this strategy class, it has a method called algorithm interface. So this context calls this algorithm interface method. And then it has a pointer. The context has a pointer of this thing. But when he initialized that pointer dynamically, he called new this one or new this one. So depending which one call, then this context context will execute one or the other one. Or maybe not, or maybe he just get past a pointer to a strategy which is having already allocated with strategy A or B. And then he just call algorithm interface. Context doesn't know about this one exists, this one, or maybe 120 more. But the algorithm from the one who was allocated will be called. So it's really good. That's, a, that's the thing about dependency. In a previous situation, maybe context have to know about all the classes, right? But using this strategy pattern, context only know about this interface. He doesn't know about anything else. And that's great. So if in your team, you are working on this context, maybe very big class. Well, big class are not good. Okay, maybe many classes, and then one of them has context. And then 
other guy keeps adding new behaviors to this strategy, then there will be no overlap. You guys, whenever uh, he implements a new strategy, you don't need to change the code here because this one has no dependency toward to whatever concrete strategies are. So yeah, that's it. So here's an example in C++ we're gonna go through very quickly. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so we have our strategy class and the strategy, uh, it has the private method justify justify is called from the format method. And then we have less left a strategy, which implements the justify to the left, I guess. And we have the right strategy, which inherits from a uh, strategy, which uh, implements the justify to the right. And we also got the center. <laughs> We have all of them and same thing, but for the center. So we have, yeah, test bed, like a testing framework, I guess. And then with a pointer to a strategy. So this guy at this level only knows about this guy. That's an important thing. So in the implementation of this class uh, definition, well, that is implementation, I was right. He actually got to know about that, but this one is normally in a CPP file, while this one, it's in a header file. So that's an important distinction because now you are removing dependency from here to the other classes, which in this case happen to be three, but it can be just always thinking, you always a scale up, it can be 120. So that's it. And then the method do it, which call the strategy format and then formats will call the algorithm justify. So that's how it works. Uh, well, we get from the keyboard, I standard inputs the how you want to justify the text and then we create a we set a strategy and with the kind of well zero the one to the parameter for the justification and then this one will create an instance it's actually a factory method it's called this part and then <coughs> After that one, it will call the format. So it's easy, it's neat. You can keep adding more strategies. Uh, you don't care about dependencies. It's a great thing to, to do. And it's actually obvious somehow. I mean, uh, you might have done it this one before, but the idea to give it a name, it's already worth it because it's speed up when you're talking with someone about your code. So, okay, I'm using a strategy in these classes. And then the other, the other engineer will know right away what are you talking about. But if you have to say, yeah, I'm using one class and one of the method, it's virtual and then by polymorphism. And everything. So it's, it's way longer, it's hard to understand. So yeah, that's one of the points. And yeah, so review. A strategy class has no dependencies. Yeah, that's also another part we miss it there. But a strategy class has no dependency. Testbed only depends on a strategy class. Yeah, we can add more strategies. And what if it was more than fifty <laughs> different strategies? So. I hope that I open some certain curiosity to you about the design patterns. So as everything I talk here, um, I'm talking always about tools and things that 
maybe at first it's hard to know, but if you use it, it helps you to speed up you how you make assignments or projects. So it's it's good. Uh, I mean, if you can speed up things, you can be more successful, and then you can have more free time, which is great, right? So there is more than twenty basic design patterns, and have a look. It's it's really worth it. So it's the last part of this uh, session. I would like to talk about it's a kind of popular topic. So it's about C plus plus eleven and C plus plus uh, fourteen. So we always study about C plus plus ninety eight uh, in Unist, and not only in Unist. I'm mostly in college, and well, C plus plus has been upgraded. And the new version, it looks much more neat, and it has many things that it helps you out to. I mean, to program faster and without with less headaches. So important mentions is the auto. I'm not going in order. <laughs> so auto keyboard, it's great. So before many times you will have to. Uh, well. Uh, you might have a vector or std pairs, uh, integer, three, maybe, right? Or like this. Now you can do like this. <laughs> and then you want to get a iterator for that kind of thing. So you have to iterator it's right so it was kind of hard a eh, that begin maybe yeah so it was tough you, you have to write a lot and now you can just do like this so compiler figured out what's the type so you don't have to write this thing and so the main idea here is less characters you have in your source code, more compact it looks, easier to read, and easier to maintain. So it's good. Uh, there is nothing against this one. Uh, it's a kind of feature that you just use it right away. Uh, another part is a multi-threading API. Uh, let me see if we're running out of time. Well. Sorry. So multi-threading API. Before you might have used a P thread, maybe for using different threads. That's not the case anymore. Now you can use standard thread and also a sync task. So it's another scope to cover um, how to use them. But you, if you believe my word, there are much easier way to handle multi-threading, especially about the uh, STD asynchronous task. It's very easy. And if you are using asynchronous procedures, which I normally use, it's just make your code so simple to read and it's standard. So in every platform, it will work. Uh, last thing that's actually it comes also about the multi-threading is the lambda functions for those who doesn't know. Wikipedia has great, great, great. So yeah, it works that way. So you can define a function inside your source code. I mean, inside another function. So maybe uh, very quickly. So okay, so let's add a feature to, to our session four. So maybe we had this 
uh, boys call function and then std function uh, boys boys and it works yeah f and then this one will call the function so we can just do this one <laughs> no arguments and then see out I am a lambda function and then add li line uh, okay let's try bill make yeah uh, First things first, we are, are missing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, it, it looks odd. Let's put it like this. And this one is good. The other parts in the make file. I had to specify this first flag. It's a, and I think that's all. Huh? Ah, sure. Now we need a header for that memory header. I think it was. Yeah, there is it. That's how it works. So we can pass uh, parameters, um, whatever you need, another function if you want. So it's pretty nice. Uh, I recommend you to use it. So, okay. We're done here. Move operator, uh, it's a kind of optimization for your call, then it comes pretty handy. Look it up. So uh, that was for C14. And well, so there is uh, something important for you. So before you hand out any assignments using C14 or 11, maybe uh your professor or t8 he doesn't even know about c plus plus 11 <laughs> maybe <laughs> so he might use a compiler which is pretty old and doesn't support it or maybe he will he will not use the uh, flex to enable c plus plus 11 or 14. so it's important to always before you start coding in C++ 11 or 14 to make sure that uh, if you are submitting a homework or project that your TA knows about it. Uh, I don't want to <laughs> get an email or a call saying, ah, you say I can use C++ 11, but now they gave me zero points because of you. So yeah, just make sure that <laughs> So, well, uh, the question and answer, there's no one here to question right now. So this is the end of the seminar. Uh, and next, uh, I will talk about debugging. Uh, I will introduce uh, how to debug with the D GDB and many commands that might help you to debug like a pro. So thank you, and I will see you next time.